Good morning. How many are happy that the curse is broken? Of course I'm talking about Jesus breaking the curse over my soul, over the bondage of sin and death and hell, but yes, the cups too. <laughs> you know, something I realized watching America celebrate my team, uh, I, for those of you who don't know, I grew up in Chicago, 25 years, born and raised, and went to high school, college, seminary, all in Chicago. Uh, love this city too, but you know, when it comes to the Cubs, Cubs is just my Cubs, you know what I'm saying? But as I was watching this unfold, um, to see just stupid joy <laughs> spilling out of people. I, I, we saw people crumple to their knees, weeping. Um, people like taking their Cubs hat to, to cemeteries to celebrate with their dead relatives who have watched the Cubs in futility. Um, all kinds of just amazing outbreak of pure joy. And in Chicago, um, there were, I think, five million plus people gathered, which people have said is the seventh largest gathering of human beings ever in history. Uh, and all this because, as, as one of our sisters put it, grown men in pajamas <laughs> won a game <laughs> in 108 years. Um, and it just got me to think, like, that curse is pretty cool and it's broken and all that. The goat's gone, great. But we had, we have like the curse that has like eternal consequences broken over us through Jesus, who was literally the scapegoat that was crucified on our behalf. And I don't know how much joy that spills out of us on any given day, but we, we have access to something so much greater than the Cubs winning once in a hundred years. So could we just one more time show God our gratitude and say thank you, all right? On the count of three, just celebrate the fact that the real curse is broken. One, two, three, come on. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. It's hilarious. You know, it was instant family when I saw fellow Cubs fans wearing hats. We'd just hug and fist pound for no reason. For no reason, other than the fact we're from Chicago. Um, this got me to think, even community, how much more blessed we'd be if we took our identity seriously. And speaking of which, it's so critical that we know who we are to operate functionally in this world and to live out our full calling, whether it be you know, in, the, in the secular world, as, as a business person, as an educator, you need to know who you are to stand your ground and be a person who's living out their calling with dignity and power. How much more so as a Christian, as someone who's given their life to Jesus? And baptism is that moment where you publicly identify yourself as someone who follows Jesus. And you nail down your identity in Christ before the church and before the world and say, I belong to him. My old life I left in the tub and we will literally dunk you in the tub. And my new life I live with Jesus. So I encourage you, if you've never been dunked before, okay, let's say you were confirmed because you're part of a different tradition and you want to get that full experience. Or let's say you were dunked a long time ago when you had no clue what was happening because your mommy forced you to. All right? But you really believe in Jesus and you know you do. Or let's say you recently accepted Christ and you haven't had that experience yet. We'd like to have you experience baptism this coming Sunday. If you're interested, just meet me out at Donuts with Dehan and you'll find out what that is under a tent after service. I do a quick three minutes with our newcomers, but afterwards hang out and I'll tell you all about it. And we'll get you set up for next Sunday. Cool? Awesome. Well, let me pray one more time for the, for the word. Lord, we thank you this morning. We love you. We are so grateful, God, that the real curse is broken over our lives. And just like my brother Jason prayed, Father, we know that our country is in a precarious place. But Father, we're comforted in knowing, indeed, you are on the throne. And our trust is in you, Jesus. We'll work with the leadership. And we'll pray for our, our leaders and government. But in the end, we know, Jesus, you are the answer. And we pray this in your precious son's name. Amen. So let me ask this following question in light of our series, um, Gratitude. It's a question maybe you won't expect when we talk about gratitude, but here's the question. How do you fight sin in your own life? What do you do to fight sin? Now, some of us will think about words like, uh, I read my Bible, I memorize verses, uh, I pray, I have accountability, and all those things are good things. But this morning, our passage uh, advocates for gratitude being the primary way, the most important way you fight sin. And so 
the title of my sermon, Gratitude as a Spiritual Weapon. Look with me in Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians 5, starting at verse 3. But among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. It's interesting because Paul lists some serious sins here. He talks about sexual immorality and impurity. He also talks about greed and then obscenity and vulgarity. And the single contrast he gives here is thanksgiving. And that's not something we'd expect. We would think the contrast would be holiness or righteousness or fasting, purity. But, but Paul says, okay, here's one lifestyle and here's the other, a life of gratitude. And so my task this morning is to show you how saying thank you is the most important way we fight sin. That to defeat the works of the devil in our lives, our hearts have to be full of gratitude. And maybe you've never thought of your thank yous in that way before. So the first point, the essence of sin is idolatry and misguided gratitude. Because you notice in verse 5, he, he states the sins again, uh, immoral, impure, greedy person. Such a person is an idolater. And so Paul is revealing here the nature of sin. You can commit idolatry without having a little statue of stone or wood or a larger statue of gold. You can commit idolatry by bowing down to lust or bowing down to greed. In fact, sin really is just an expression of idolatry. Because anytime you're sin, you sin, what you're saying is, I cherish something or myself to a degree greater than God that I would violate God to please this or please myself. And so anytime you sin, you really are committing an act of idolatry because you're putting something of greater value than God. And here is where, therefore, gratitude and idolatry connect. This is why Paul contrasts idolatry with gratitude. Uh, listen to what Scott Haifman writes, a New Testament scholar. The essence of sin is misguided gratitude. As dependent creatures, we all by nature think somebody or something, usually ourselves, uh, for what we experience and achieve. And the ultimate object of our gratitude becomes the object of our worship. Did you hear that? The ultimate object of our gratitude becomes the object of our worship. So idolatry comes down to where you say the most thank yous in your life. You will worship whatever makes you happy. Wherever you feel most fulfilled, most pleased, most full of power and vitality and pleasure and meaning is what you end up worshiping. And if it's not God, then what Paul is saying is it's idolatry. Think of Adam and Eve. They are holding this apple or this fruit, considering should we bite down? And no one's forcing them to. There is no obligation to. The reason they eventually bite down on that forbidden fruit is because of this promise that life will be better without God. That I can be God. I can be the arbiter of my own life and my own meaning. Therefore, I will bite down on this fruit. And so, the issue of sin and, and the issue of idolatry comes down to where you say thank yous. Who do you thank? Where does your heart lean into when it's seeking pleasure and power, meaning fulfillment? Because where you are most grateful is where you worship. What you're most grateful for is what you end up worshiping and what your life wraps around. Second, you have to fight fire with fire. Growing up, this is the way often my youth pastors talked about sin. 
it's bad, don't do it, right? Which is true. And they would say stuff like, you know, don't go dancing because as you, as you move to rock music, <laughs> it, you're imitating people writhing in hell, so don't do it. That kind of ruined dancing for me. Um, and I can't dance anyway, so it kind of works. But um, I, I remember hearing um, <laughs> this one youth pastor who, who took uh, cassette tapes, or I don't know what he used, he backmasked it to find hidden subliminal messages <laughs> in the music. And so we would backmask ACDC and all of these Led Zeppelin and find like satanic messages in it. And we're like, oh, no rock music, no music, no music outside of like Michael W. Smith and <laughs> Amy Grant. That's way back. Anyway, <laughs> Stephen Curtis Chapman. And, and so this is the way as growing up and many of you experienced that, that sin is bad. Don't do it. And that's true. Sin is bad. But to receive a message of prohibition alone doesn't cut it. Because as much as we know sin is bad, sin feels really good. Doesn't it? That's why we keep doing it. The human heart is a desire factory. You're constantly hungering and wanting, whether it be joy, pleasure, power, like your heart generates desires all the time. And if the only message you have coming out of the Bible, the only thing you understand coming from your pastor's mouth is sin is bad, sin is bad, sin is bad, sin is bad, you're going to fail because it doesn't address the deep desires of the heart. It, yeah, it might be bad, but what can fulfill the hunger and my desire for pleasure and meaning and vitality? The reason that I talk about fighting fire with fire is that you have to fight sin on its terms. Sin is a false promise of pleasure, a false promise of power, a false promise of vitality. And you can't fight it by just saying it's wrong and it's bad. You have to overwhelm it with a better desire or a more fulfilling end to that desire. C.S. Lewis, one of my favorite authors, one of the most brilliant Christian thinkers, just thinkers, period, writes this. Indeed, if we consider the unblushing promises of reward and the staggering nature of the rewards promised in the Gospels, it would seem that our Lord finds our desire not too strong but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. I think of my four-year-old daughter, Emily, playing in the mud. And how do I, as a father, extract her from that mess? Of course, I could yell at her and tell her it's bad, it's dirty. And she might listen out of fear of losing dessert <laughs> or whatever it is. Um, but I'm not addressing her deeper desire to play. And she'll go right back to that mud. She'll be confused as to why I'm violating her desire to play. Daddy's bad, daddy's mean. The better way is to say, um, if you get out and get cleaned up, I'll take you to the beach. We can make sandcastles by the ocean. Or better yet, if you get cleaned up, I'll take you to Disneyland, <laughs> right? Which is not the happiest place on earth for me, but it might be for her. Or you can have a play date with Hadley or one of your close friends. You could do something so much better and she'll be, she'll be booking into the house and, and getting changed. Why? Because we're addressing the root of the problem. Not just the behavior, but the root. She wants to play. And there's the choice of mud or the choice of ocean. And that's what Paul is getting at when he says, do not commit sexual immorality or be greedy, but be full of thanksgiving. It's saying you, you need to overwhelm your hunger for pleasure with the goodness of God. You need to know how good he is to be able to fight against the temptation of sin. We often talk about running away from sin, but really the issue is running towards God away from sin. And you leave God out of the picture, then you don't know what you're running away from. So that's the reason why Paul contrasts all these sins with thanksgiving because your heart needs to be pleased. 
Your heart is hungering and demanding meaning, pleasure, and vitality. And just to say, no, 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 sin is bad, doesn't address the deeper needs of the soul. And so Paul is saying, the way you effectively fight sin is you overwhelm it with a stronger and better desire, which is to, 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 be, to be fulfilled by God, to be satisfied by God. All right, so let's apply this to specific sins. Paul mentions a few specifically. Let's look at lust. It says in verse 3, But among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity. Now, those two words, sexual immorality and impurity, describes an atmosphere of lust. Specifically, sex before marriage, but any other kind of sexual perversions is included in these two words. And Ephesus, the city that Paul's addressing, was a city that was defined by sexual immorality. The city had the temple of Artemis, which was um, a goddess that they worshipped. And the way you worshipped was you'd go and have a massive citywide orgy in the temple. They had temple prostitutes. And the way you worshipped this god is you had sex with these prostitutes. It was insane. And so this city didn't just have sexual issues. Like it was defined and, and, and captivated by lust. Kind of reminds me of our city, Los Angeles. We're porn capital. 90 some odd percent of all porn in the U.S. is produced here in the valley. And so there's some similarities there. So how do you then fight when you're in a city or in an environment, whether it be Ephesus or Los Angeles, where lust is the order of the day? It's celebrated. It's wrapped into everything we see and touch. It's what we live in. Well, turn your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 1. You'll find something interesting here. 2 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 3. His divine power has given us everything we need for godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. I find that really interesting. That the way Peter says you fight the evil desires of the world, lust being one of the primary ones, is you put your faith and engage these great, these good promises of God. We're used to hearing people say uh, sexual immorality is bad. Lust is bad. I get it. But Peter's strategy here is saying, okay, assuming that, the, the most effective way of engaging our souls against lust is to actually taste how, go, how good God is and the promises that he gives us. There's a story from Leadership Journal, which is a Christian publication for pastors, back in the 80s, almost 30 years ago. It was an article of a pastor who was really stuck in this addiction of sex. He would preach on a Sunday and go to a strip club Sunday evening without his wife and kids knowing. And he lived like this for 12 years. And no matter how much he knew that lust was bad, sexual immorality was bad, he could not pull himself out of this downward spiral of sin and perversion. Until he read a book by Francois Myriac, where God is described in such beauty, in such holiness, in such purity, that it left him just dumbstruck at how much he missed God. And there was a verse that popped out of that book that he focused on where it says in Matthew 5, 8, blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. And it was that promise of seeing God that pulled him out of that spiral. Because when he heard that promise, all the no's didn't mean as much as knowing that in purity he can see God. And that's what he missed. He had li been living in the gray shadow world of lust. Where, yeah, for the moment it titillates, but the severe hangover you have where the color drains and you live in a world where you feel like God is far and you can't hear, he can't hear your prayers. Like he's, he was done with that in his soul and he wanted to see God. 
And that hunger to taste God and know God is what pulled him out of that addiction. God, I need you. I want to see you. I want to know that you're good. That's why even for lust, you cannot fight it by simply knowing that it's bad, that premarital sex is bad, that sexual immorality is bad, because as much as people tell you it's bad, it feels good. And it addresses needs in our heart. So how do you really stand in a culture soaked with sex? It's when your heart can experience a better, more richer pleasure of knowing God's goodness, of seeing God for who he is. And I know for some of you, you have not just tasted this man's journey, but you're living in it, where your life has been hollowed out by sexual immorality. And it's been a long time since you've seen God in a way that you want to see God. And so this morning, I'm trying to tell you that to fight sin is not to simply know that you have made mistakes and you feel guilty and you're ashamed, but it's to know that there is this promise that you can see God if you choose purity, that you can taste God's goodness, that there's going to be a a greater pleasure and a richer joy in being close to God than being close to whatever else you're swimming in. 1 Corinthians 6, 18 through 19 says, and we all know this if we've been fighting lust, flee from sexual immorality. Flee from it. Run from it. All other sins a man commits are outside his body, but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you receive from God? You are not your own. Now we hear the flee part, But that second part is even more important. Why do we run? Because it says that we are temples of the Holy Spirit. That God actually lives in us. That's why we run. We run to flee the thing that is robbing me of my intimacy and presence with God. Paul says, cherish this, guys. You literally house God inside you. Don't let anything happen to you that would rob you of the intimacy that was given to you through the blood of Jesus. You get God inside you. Why would you let something threaten that? There's a a rock climber named Errol Ralston back in 2003 who was climbing, doing a solo climb. A boulder fell on his arm and pinned his arm. For five days, he tried desperately to get this boulder off his arm, but uh, to no avail. And he knew he would die. So he bent his arm in a way to break the bones and took the knife he had to saw through sinew, muscle, and tissue. And he left that arm under the rock, rappelled down a couple hundred feet to find other climbers who would take him to uh, medical care. When Jesus says gouge out an eye or cut off your arm to prevent yourself from sinning. And he's referring specifically to sexual immorality in that passage, if you look back on Matthew. Jesus is tapping into a primal desire that we all share, which is, I want to live! (laughs) I need to live! I would rather let this arm stay under the rock if I can preserve my life And who knows, is he a father? Maybe he has kids to live for, a wife to go back to. If not, he knows that there's more of life to live, even without an arm, that this life is more precious than than keeping this dead arm attached to my body. And so he'll do whatever he takes, whatever it takes to preserve this life that's critical to him, so much so that he'll amputate. And what Jesus is saying is, if you know how good it is to have God inside you, to have his presence, to taste his love. And for those of you who've never have, I'll give you a chance in just a bit. There is nothing like being loved by God. Can you all testify to those of you who know this love? When you have been hungering for the love that will satisfy and you haven't found it in a person or in a thing or in yourself and you finally experience the love of God, it is mind-blowing and it's eternal 
And it's unconditional, and there's no other love like it. And what Jesus is saying, if you've tasted of this love, you will do everything you can to cherish it and guard it. Because it's worth it. Amen. What gives you the power to turn that channel off? Or to or not go to that website? Or to not go to this place? Or be with this person that always pulls you into sexual immorality? Well, you need to have something to fight for. Something to preserve. Because if you don't have intimacy with God, then there's nothing to fight for. Your heart will be pleased. And if you can't find that pleasure in God, you'll find it in sex. Then he talks about greed. And if you think sexual immorality is bad, greed's far worse. Because Jesus talks about sexual immorality once. He talks about greed more than heaven and hell combined. Second to the kingdom. Why? Because money is that thing we so easily worship more than anything else. Because money is tangible power. Tangible meaning. It's tangible answers to many of our hungers. So how do you fight that? Ephesus was like Manhattan in, the, in Asia Minor. Right? It was the center of not just sex, but also of power and money in Asia Minor. So Paul's addressing the two biggest issues the city faces. Sexual immorality and greed. Wanting things more than God. How do you fight that? Well, turn your Bibles to Hebrews 13. Hebrews 13. Starting at verse 5. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Notice that. The author of Hebrews contrasts the love of money with contentment in God. Again, it's not just money's bad. Living for money's evil. Don't do it. Instead, the author says, okay, here's how you preserve your heart from the love of money. Be really happy in God. And know that he's your helper. Know that he'll be your provider. Because in the end, that's what the battle really is. Because money buys us things that helps define ourselves. So for instance... If you find yourself in a place where you don't know your worth, there's a real existential question. Will God be my helper? Or will I help myself by buying my self-worth? Buying things to put on my body, to drive on my wrist, that'll say I'm somebody. Let's say you're in a place where you lack purpose and meaning. The question then becomes, is God my helper? Or am I going to buy myself a calling and purpose? Just find the highest paying job and say, that's my life. Maybe you come to a place of shame. And that existential question, who is my helper? Is it God who will heal me and forgive me? Or will I just buy distractions that will take my mind off the fact that I'm constantly ashamed? Or maybe the most easy one to talk about is you're in need. You're in need, like you, you need an apartment, you need, you know, things, and you have to ask, who's my helper, the God provider, or will I seek money as the answer? But I found this list on the internet of all the things money cannot buy. So, here we go. Money can buy a bed, but it cannot buy sleep. Money can buy books, but it cannot buy brains. Money can buy food, but not appetite. Money can be a, buy finery, but not beauty. Money can buy a house, but not a home. Money can buy medicine, but not health. Money can buy luxuries, but not culture. Money can buy amusement, but not happiness. Money can buy companions, but not friends. Money can buy flattery, but not respect. And we see in this list, just this list alone, how money is a false god. The deepest things we really need, money cannot 
buy. And to add to this list, money cannot buy redemption. Money cannot buy forgiveness. Money can't buy inner healing. Money can't buy you spiritual freedom. And yet in Ephesians 1, it says, Jesus has purchased every spiritual blessing for you in heaven through him. Free. You can receive it freely. And so how do you fight off greed? The same way you fight off lust, the same way you fight off all sin, is contentment in God. God, you are enough. God, I'm happy with you. God, you give me the deepest things I really need. And therefore, I'm not going to throw myself at money to give me these deeper things money can't even buy. And we know that. But God, you can give it. And you have given it through Jesus. So Paul then moves on to talk about vulgarity and obscenity. And, and, and for the lack of time, I'm not going to address those specifically because they really flow out of a greedy, immoral heart. So if you address those issues, the speech will take care of itself, generally. So I'm just going to fast forward to a story I want to close with. There was a season uh, in my marriage where my wife and I were having a rough patch. This was back before Grace Covenant. We were going through a building campaign at my old church. And we kind of just burnt out. And so we went out to Colorado for um, a week of mentoring from a couple. And initially they kind of just asked us questions and we listed our complaints and all the things we thought were wrong. And surprisingly, instead of working through that list comprehensively, what they did was they had to sit face to face and just look at each other. And it was a very awkward experience. Okay, I recommend it for those of you who are married. Take a couple minutes and just sit really close, eyeball to eyeball, and stare at each other. Okay? And what's funny was he gave no instructions. He just said, sit here and look at each other until I say something else. And so we sat there giggling, nervous. Like, oh, that's what my wife looks like. Eh, okay, interesting. And she said, you know, because we hadn't seen each other in so long. We were always passing by. And then he said, I want you to encourage your spouse. Just tell your spouse what he or she means to you. It's an emotion for my wife to go first. <laughs> Just kind of break the ice, Julian. And, um, and I remember staring at each other and she said something like, you're a loving husband and a good man. And then giggling went to just bawling. <laughs> just like, <laughs> just, we're both crying. And I'm, I'm saying words to her. And what our mentor said is that if you guys connect and are intimate, love covers over a multitude of sins. Intimacy can break through all the various things that we're squabbling about and that we're, you know, cut in a thousand different ways. If you can connect and see each other, and you're intimate, that'll address so many of the issues you've listed. And I share that because we are people who are always tempted and in falling into sin, yes? Whether it be lust, whether it be greed, and many other things that Paul didn't mention, but lust and greed are often like the one-two punch. You know what is the best medicine for the soul? It's intimacy with Jesus. When is the last time you spent a good 30 minutes just focusing on the person of Jesus? And for those of you where 30 minutes is normal, when's the last time you spent an hour or a day? Just you, your journal, Jesus, maybe some Christian music or whatever gets you into a mood of worship where you just lavished time on him and enjoyed him, like really enjoyed him and knew and just going through promises of God or whatever you, it takes for you to know his goodness and taste his goodness because that is the best medicine for the soul. If you do not enjoy Jesus, you are dry chaff that can blow in the wind and Satan will have his day with you. But if you treasure Jesus, if you love Jesus and experience his love, you're going to fight for that. You're going to fight for that. And so my challenge for you guys 
is that gratitude is not just polite conversation. We let, learned last week. It's the eyes of faith. It's, it's the way you view your, 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 your reality. But today, I want to sharpen that spear. Gratitude is the only and most effective, sustainable strategy against sin. Unless there is constant overflowing of thanksgiving and joy towards Jesus because you're enjoying him, you will be very susceptible to the attacks of the evil one. So let's start here. If you can bow your heads. We're about to take communion, but I want to give this invitation before I do because communion won't make any sense to you if you don't have a relationship with Jesus. So if you're in, these, in this audience and you know you're swimming in some things that are really toxic to your soul and you found no escape, and as they talk about Jesus, there's this longing to know him and you've never had a chance to really give your life in a definitive way and say, Jesus, I invite you into my heart. Be my Lord, be my leader, be my savior. I, I want to give you that chance right now. And that way, if you make this decision, this meal will actually mean something. Communion will mean something. So, so if that's you, and you, you want to make a decision for Jesus, give him your life. Just slip your hand in the air so I can pray for you. I see you in the back. I see two hands in the back. Praise God. Anyone else? I see you in the front. Anyone else? I see you in the back. I see you in the front. Amen. Anyone else? I see you on the side. Good. I see six hands so far. Praise God. Okay, for the six of you, if you can just say this quietly. God, thank you for loving me. I confess I'm a sinner. I confess I cannot save myself. I believe, Jesus, you came, you died, and you resurrected for me. Thank you for taking my penalty. Jesus, I invite you into my heart. Would you take my life? And thank you, Jesus, that now I am a son or a daughter of God to be with you forever. I love you, Jesus.